thank you very much for inviting me to this site event. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to start off by talking about how when, when we discover something inconvenient to our, our lifestyle, it takes years to adjust to it, years to accept it, to believe it, and then to do something about it, to, to break out of the box and not stick with the, uh, the lifestyle that, that we've been used to. A good example is cigarette smoking. A long time ago, we didn't know it did harm to our, to our bodies. And after we were pretty sure it did, it took years and years for, for us to stop uh, glorifying smoking in commercials, et cetera, to put the warning label on the cigarettes, et cetera. Now we do, and there are fewer smokers. It's not seen as a, as a desirable thing to do. Another example is sunburn. When I was a kid in the 1950s, uh, it, it was considered a good thing to do to get a nice tan. And even a burn, other than it hurting, was not considered dangerous. And I used to get sunburnt many times a year, badly, and thought, well, you know, it's, it's neat. It, it gets rid of my acne, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> but then later I realized I'm, my skin's not going to be in good shape later. Well, the same thing happens here with our climate change. It's obvious that we shouldn't be driving these big vehicles, these SUVs, and yet most people who like SUVs continue to feel good about, about purchasing them and driving them. And it's, it's not considered a bad thing to do. I have some friends who like SUVs, and I just, you know, I'm not a pushy person. I just, I just give a hint, you know, why do you need such a big car? And they say, oh, it's nice, you know, you can, you can put things in it. it. It has all sorts of conveniences. And, and besides, look around you, everybody's got them, you know, why not me? And they're not that much more expensive than a small car. So we haven't really accepted that temperatures are gradually rising. And part of that is because of the much less than perfect quality of our dynamical climate change models that we run on high-speed computers, many, many reputable institutes develop these climate change models and initiate them with projected changes in greenhouse gases, and one model gives twice as much warming as another. Some of them give three times as much warming as, as some others. None of them cool, though. So it's pretty much a foregone conclusion, and anybody with any scientific knowledge knows the, what a greenhouse gas is and what it does to the temperature. It lets in almost as much radiation as, as without the gas, but it doesn't let it escape back out. It can, only, it can only increase the temperature gradually. And also, we know that there's been at least a 20% increase in CO2 alone in the last two or three decades. It's measurable. And it's, it's a foregone conclusion it's going to make the globe warm. It's <coughs> less obvious how it will change the precipitation patterns. But uh, the last IPCC report, the one that's been coming out and, and, and referred to several times already today by the previous speakers, has a lot more confidence in, in the, that it's a fact that people are causing the global temperature to rise. Mm. The exact amount to occur with this amount of greenhouse gas increase over the next 50 years is not certain. It could be anywhere from just one degree centigrade up to several degrees centigrade. There's still a lot of uncertainty, but why should we risk the chance? Even if it's the, the low part of the, of the range, that's still enough to notice. It's still enough to affect the economies of many countries. And the precipitation effects are also, uh, even though they're le a lot less certain and there's not a net global decrease or increase, after all, there's a, there's a, there's a budget of water substance on the planet. But a lot of models show that along the tropics there'll be increases in, in precipitation, not all, over all longitudes, but a lot of the very low equatorial latitudes 
we'll get more rainfall because the sea surface temperature will be warmer, there will be more thunderstorms, more convection, and that does something to the circulation patterns across the whole globe. It makes for different circulation patterns that, uh, that originate because of heating in the upper atmosphere in the tropics caused by precipitation occurring more in the tropics. When you condense water vapor to water, which is what happens in clouds, you release heat. And that's going to increase what we call the Hadley circulation, the, the main uh, source of heating to outside the tropics where you get air flow going toward the two poles and then you get a storm track and the bottom line is it will probably become drier in the subtropics than it has been. Anywhere from 10 to 15 degrees away from the equator of latitude which is in some of the islands we've been talking about are likely to get drier and that's 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 very unfavorable for, for economic uh, productivity for, for sustained development. Think of rain-fed agriculture. So the main thing that I'm trying to say is that there's been a lack of credibility in, if, at first in the science community about global climate change. Now that's becoming more certain, not completely certain. Some of the people against acceptance of global climate change demand like at least 98 percent certainty we have somewhere around 90 or the low 90s. To me, that's pretty high. It's not like 75 like it, it was a few, a, a decade ago. It's warming up and CO2 is increasing. So I believe strongly that, that the president of countries and governmental uh, uh, leaderships should accept global warming as a reality, even though they're not 100% sure and policy changes should be put into place. The, the developed countries should set the example for the rest. The United States, for example, we should get these big SUVs down to a much lower percentage of the totality of all the cars on the road. We should not pollute so much from air travel. The place where I work, the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, we're trying to capacity build the poorer countries, especially in Africa and, and in, in some Asian countries, by having them fly out to us and stay with us for a, a month and learn all about climate prediction. I'm basically not a climate change scientist. I know enough, but, I, but my real specialty is seasonal climate forecasting. Like when there's an El Nino, there's going to be rainfall deficits in certain known seasons, seasons and regions. We can help developing countries learn how to take care of that and, and that sort of thing. But global change is so important and we have to shorten the time lag before all levels of society accept that it's a danger just like cigarette smoking is a danger. We haven't gotten there yet. We have to get to that stage where all of us know what we're doing, increasing the temperature and how it affects everything. The credibility is still not as high as it should be. And I'll stop with that.